Yeah. Okay, so we have to. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lee Wang Choi. Uh, I'm from Singapore. I am the moderator for this uh, session. Uh, we have as speakers uh, Ana Leticia uh, from Latitude in uh, Brazil, uh, June Laksamana um, from uh, Gallery Rachel in uh, Indonesia, and Michelle Wong from the Asia Art Archive uh, here. So uh, we'll, we'll um, start right away. Um, I'll just hand over to Anna. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Art Basel Hong Kong and Asian Art Archive partners uh, of this panel. When we came up with this idea of um, uh, having a panel to discuss uh, contemporary art ecologies in dynamic economies and establish a dialogue of uh, these places where uh, we have quite of uh, dynamic uh, but still new art systems and uh, we thought that could be uh, a good platform in Art Basel Hong Kong to get together and uh, not going through mainstream or places we know to discuss what's happening in the southern re regions although Brazil and Asia is sort of uh, far away uh, from each other uh, I believe we can identify some synergies and uh, interesting points to exchange so that was the idea uh, I'm gonna go through a very um, in sort of a superficial and quick look at uh, what the Brazilian contemporary art system is as I suppose some of or most of you uh, are not familiar with uh, so just uh, <laughs> First facts like uh, where we are located in map, the map uh, and our size and some data on um, the country. Uh, we are actually the seventh economy of the world, but we have a very unequal country uh, where the GDP per capita is really puts us uh, far behind What's other countries. The population? the population is around 200 million. Uh, we are a former Portuguese colony uh, and we had in the recent history a period of dictatorship that took like almost 20 years and put us a bit of an isolated uh, place uh, during uh, until the 80s. Here you can see better. Uh, so we were a democracy since 89. But talking about the art system, uh, we are now getting some visibility or more visibility than uh, we used to have. Uh, but the system itself is quite, uh, uh, we have a traditional uh, art system that started with the time we were still a colony. So we have the first imperial uh, Royal Academy of Arts uh, where the teachers from France uh, were brought uh, to create this, this school. So the history of the system is quite old and it's very related to e Europe, right? Uh, secondly, uh, second moment, uh, when, when the system started to uh, more uh, recent in the creation of a modern art system, let's say, uh, we have the Sao Paulo and there's a really Problem, a typo in, in the text, but uh, never, never mind. Um, our, the first uh, Sao Paulo Biennial was created in 1951, uh, which means that was the second international biennial created in the world after Venice. Uh, our museums of modern art are very much related uh, to the, the New York uh, Museum of Modern Art, and there are relations between the patrons in Brazil and Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an idea of how, how, how the system was evolving. Uh, of course, another uh, important uh, uh, reference of uh, the modern art system is architecture, the modern Brazilian architecture. It was related also uh, uh, to the modern art. And there's a, this integration uh, between architecture and uh, art in the 60s. Uh, so Brasilia would be the synthesis of this, um, this idea of having a new city, uh, what uh, Mario Pedrosa, which is a very important reference as an art critic, called um, Brasilia New City Synthesis of the Arts. 
Well, uh, later on, uh, we had a sort of interruption of this modernization process uh, in the dictatorship years, but uh, of course, it was not an interruption for the art production. The artists were uh, producing, circulating. Many of them went into exile. Uh, the art system in Brazil remained um, active, but in a much more uh, subtle way uh, with artists doing mailing art, uh, with uh, uh, directors of institutions uh, uh, being connected uh, to other uh, places in the world, but having to deal with uh, this dictatorship that uh, was uh, uh, really very harsh. Um, at some point uh, in the 70s, uh, there was a boycott for the Sao Paulo Biennial, uh, led by Pierre Restani in France, because uh, because of the situation that artists and the, the, the people in the art field were experienced over there. Um, well, to talk about a more recent history and what's going on, and I'd like to think about the. I always like it to think about the Brazil art system in relation with what is going on uh, with the world. And the recent change, we're talking now about a global art map, or uh, if there's such a thing. Uh, but what I see, uh, it's a very slow change in these uh, structures of power, of course, and that's why I think it's so interesting also to be here sitting with you guys, uh, because we're kind of in a more horizontal dialogue. Uh, but, uh, well, in, in the inter international context in the 90s, things uh, well start to change and multiculturalism became uh, the, the word uh, to talk about uh, the contemporary art and the contemporary art, international contemporary art world. Um, in Brazil, what was happening, uh, it was, uh, well, we came back to democracy in the end of the 80s. Uh, we had uh, new cultural policy that was much driven to the uh, private sector or encouraging the private sector to invest in uh, culture. So the government kind of uh, handed out uh, its responsibilities. Uh, we create a um, tax break law for cultural projects that still now uh, a very important uh, tool uh, to develop art projects and much used by institutions, what makes also uh, the institutions be <clears throat> obliged, let's say, uh, to have projects that are going to work uh, and be easy to sell to corporate uh, companies uh, that will invest in the project. So it's to, to have a program in a cultural institution uh, and the, the temporary events, uh, the institutions are uh, in their everyday activities uh, having to deal with marketing departments of companies and selling the projects every time. So it's kind of hard to develop um, uh, a line or a profile of activities having to deal with that uh, challenge and fundraising all the time. Uh, so uh, these new policies led to a creation of a number of private institutions, some of them uh, related to banks or uh, big companies. Uh, here just some examples of um, uh, events and institutions that were created in, in the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, maybe probably the most known is Inyo Ching. Uh, which was created by a, a big entrepreneur, uh, Bernardo Paz, and where he commissions artists to build their own pavilions and give them the liberty to uh, create specific site-specific works. But we also have museums in different cities of Brazil being created uh, by uh, private initiatives. Um, uh, well, after 2005, then there's still uh, another big change that we can see. Uh, first, the growth of the market, really, like after 2005, that's when we see uh, 
number of galleries uh, being opened, uh, going interna to international art fairs, the creation of Sao Paulo Art Fair, and so on. Uh, and but also we see an increasing of other uh, art initiatives, both by private, public, and independent. So here we have images of um, the Sao Paulo Art Fair, which is in a building uh, by Niemeyer, and it's where also the Sao Paulo Biennial is uh, held. MAR is the Museum of Art of Rio, which just opened last year. And uh, on the right is also in a building of Niemeyer, land, uh, very, a landmark of Sao Paulo, Copan, it's called, where we have uh, a sort of independent space that works in collaboration uh, with galleries as well. So this uh, interaction uh, between the market and the, the independent institutions, that something that we are seeing uh, recently. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the very, very last years, I would say two, three years, uh, we are seeing this process to accelerate and the visibility of Brazil or Brazilian art system and growing internationally. We're having more publications, art, art platforms, residencies, uh, the market's really growing. Uh, I'm consultant, consultant for an association of galleries, and uh, we have around 50 galleries. Uh, half of them were created from 2010 and on. So it's this very young mark, spending market. Uh, and some of them, they're already going internationally. You can see um, three Brazilian galleries here in the fair. Mendes Wood is one that was created in 2010 and they are doing incredibly well uh, internationally. And the increasing of this uh, international visibility. So people are talking about Brazil. And uh, I always question and uh, think what, what, what's uh, what's happening really, what, what, why it's so much interested, what's, what's going on. Uh, here you can see images of two shows on the left. Um, Ligia Clark at the MoMA that just opened last week. On the right you have Mira Shandow at the Tate that was uh, uh, on view during Freeze London uh, last year. Uh, but in the, in the other hand we have like uh, independent uh, space or residences as Espaço Forte that's in the northeast of Brazil, receiving and being connected uh, to curators uh, and artists all over the world. We have young galleries like Jacqueline Martins uh, participating in uh, also international art fairs. So uh, it's a moment, it's an interesting moment, it's a very dynamic moment, uh, but that makes me think about which are the determinants and interests uh, beyond this international recognition and if there is an international recognition. And here it's, uh, sorry, the picture is not that good, but uh, this is uh, uh, showing this, the supporters for the Mira Shando show at the Tate. And we see the Brazilian bank uh, as main sponsor, Itaú. And we see also a number of private col Brazilian collectors that now are joining the board of international museums and working on bringing Brazil uh, uh, to the spot, to giving them it more more visibility. But of course, these uh, international institutions or international agencies are looking at Brazil also because we have resources, we have production, but we have also means to finance projects uh, in a context that some some place or place that would be very central are not anymore don't have that much uh, resources anymore to lead their projects. Uh, just so to, to end, uh, and we can come back to all these points uh, in the discussion. Uh, the challenges uh, of a dynamic and unbalanced art system in Brazil have, uh, as I said, uh, um, at the moment, a very dynamic and growing market, uh, a high visibility for the Brazilian artists abroad. Uh, we have a lack of appropriate cultural public policies. Uh, which makes sometimes the market take over uh, some, uh, let's say, um, uh, initiatives that could be or should be uh, in, the, in the public uh, side, as uh, like encouraging is experimentation or leaving the artists the possibilities to do projects that uh, are not commercial, 
and we don't see that in the public institutions which are not collecting and not have, they don't have the funds or they don't have in, even the right policies to do it so to foster the contemporary art production and you see then the market doing things that uh, we usually would not think they, they would do. Um, so the vulnerability of the public institutions, uh, low participation of other cultural agencies in, ter in the international scene. I mean, we've been, we are seeing the uh, art market agents and the artists circulating a lot, but you don't see that much curators, writers, and, and so on yet. Okay, yeah, I was going to ask precisely about that because I would have um, assumed that you would have a very sort of strong tradition, intellectual tradition, Yes. and, and how that's sort of uh, dealing with that. But rather than go into that, let me ask you to talk about your work at Latitude, uh, if you can end on that note. Yeah. Okay, uh, so Latitude is a, a project, uh, it's a private public initiative, uh, in one side we have the Association of Galleries, in the other side we have Apex, which is an agency that uh, encourages uh, exports of 80 sectors of the economy. So Latitude gets funds from this agency to promote the Brazilian galleries abroad. Uh, so in the end, the, 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 the mission of this project is to raise exports. Uh, to, uh, to do it so, uh, we have to do a number of other things. and. Um, a lot of cultural promotion as well. So here's where I say that that system is really imbalanced because this kind of activity or like being in a talk or doing publications in English, it's still a very uh, important issue. You don't have that, that many uh, magazines or publications uh, of content in English about the Brazilian art production and Brazilian art system in general. So Latitude is doing this kind of thing. We just launched it. Uh, uh, online uh, book, or not exactly a book, but um, it's not a magazine either, but it's called Platform. You can download from the Apple Store, and there is their content about the system, the market, the artists, and interview with key people from the system, and so on. So, uh, Latitude is, uh, yeah, coming to, uh, maybe to fulfill a gap. Uh, of the lack of uh, cultural policy, appropriate cultural policy. Thanks, so. Anna Leticia. Um, our next speaker is June. Um, Here we, we can find yeah, the information. Great. So it, it is, you can get it from uh, iTunes as well. Um, yes. That's fantastic. Okay. Uh, these things are very strange. We're all commenting on them. We feel very kind of... <laughs> <laughs> okay, June. Okay. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to give a very short introduction about what uh, I do and what uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit. But I think that uh, I was prepared more for a discussion yeah. between us. So uh, I started um, basically a contemporary art gallery two years ago. And it used to be called Gallery Rachel. And basically at the time, I didn't know anything about art. So at the time, I thought that what was most necessary in terms of uh, what to do at the time was to build a normal conventional art gallery. Going through, um, after a year, uh, I learned a lot. I experienced a lot of things and met a lot of people. And I realized that the need uh, or maybe the niche that we were to fill was much more akin to an alternative space. So it's sort of in between a hybrid model, I suppose, between a contemporary art gallery and an alternative space, as well as uh, trying to do projects that <clears throat> may not necessarily be commercial in nature. Um, we try to work with young artists and try to develop new career paths for them. We also try to work with developed artists though and try to show uh, <clears throat> different elements of their artistic practices that may not uh, have been revealed prior to that. But today basically what I'll be talking about uh, more, more or less is about market forces in Indonesia, the institutional infrastructure of what's going on, independent initiatives, developing biennials that are actually growing and it's quite interesting and the notion of philanthropy and uh, new models and new ideas that are happening in Indonesia perhaps so that's me I think there's a really interesting point of comparison between um, our two pre uh, our, two, our two speakers so far how you know um, both are sort of the giants in the region 
uh, and they're also you know this kind of comparable size. Um, so so that you know there you know when you talk about uh, a, a, a dynamic but uh, balanced uh, you know unbalanced situation in Brazil, you had earlier described, uh, and I won't take away the the phrase that you used. Uh, um, you know the the whole sort of ec ecology in, in Indonesia is, as you were saying, yeah, it's a beautiful mess. A beautiful it mess. Really mm. uh, so you know, I mean, you have these two mm. two sort of situations, and it'll be interesting as we sort of converse a little bit more. Mm. Uh, you know, some kinds of points of comparisons, and uh, whether or not the parallels are, um, you know, resonant, or are they really of, you know, uh, are they disparate? You know, th there are diversities, but are there disparities as well? Are they are they difficult points of comparisons. But let's move then to uh, Michelle, um, who's based with uh, the archive. There you go. Thank you. Pleasure. So I'll just briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Michelle. Okay, there we go. Uh, I work for the Asia Art Archive. So for those of you who don't know um, the AAA, uh, we are a not-for-profit um, organization. This is the thing that I will speak about after I introduce AAA. But Anyway, uh, AAA is a not-for-profit uh, organization. Our headquarters is based in Hong Kong. We are um, dedicated to documenting and facilitating research in contemporary art. I am um, AAA's researcher based in Hong Kong, so um, I work on several projects that are in Hong Kong. But, um, today what I will speak about is actually a magazine on photography that ran from 1992 to 1999. I will kind of use the coming a few minutes to kind of convince you, to bring you with me that um, a magazine, especially you know, artist-run magazines, are a great way to think through art ecologies and art infrastructures. Uh, and I was just thinking through how um, the previous two speakers, when we were speaking about art ecologies, I think, uh, one of the very important things that uh, an art ecology is based on is exhibitions, and by extension, the curatorial that drives these exhibitions. And you also spoke about the pedagogy, you know, art schools, how are artists being trained, are artists, being, are artists teaching in these art schools, um, and also art writing, like what's being written about, how do they circulate, and in what language. Um, I think this magazine that I'm going to speak about can kind of offer uh, uh, will be a, a, a fascinating case, actually. So this is Dislocation. Um, it was a Hong Kong-based photography magazine um, that ran from 1992 to 1999. And uh, magazines are interesting to think through for ecologies for a couple of reasons, I guess, because they have a very clear group of audience. They kind of know or want to reach out to a certain group of readers. Uh, Self-funded and kind of artist-run magazines have uh, a very strong agency. They do what they want to do, and uh, very often in limit, very limited resources. So that um, they end up doing things in very creative and organic ways, and very often in unbalanced um, art ecologies. That's also what happens as well. Um, so this uh, photography magazine was actually a supplement to a salon photography magazine that was very long-standing. This uh, the, on your left is. Yes, on your left is Photo Pictorial, uh, which was founded in 1964, ran until 2005, and was a salon photography magazine, and it was one of the first magazines to enter the doors of China in 1981, after the Cultural Revolution. And on the right is a cover of uh, Dislocation, which is the supplement of uh, Photo Pictorial that was inserted into it, uh, and was you know, a very tiny magazine of eight spreads. And basically, the editors of Dislocation and the editors of Photo Pictorial struck a deal, saying, I will, uh, Photo Pictorial said, I'll print for you for free eight spreads, and you can do whatever you want. And this was based on this belief that photography is going on a, a very different direction from salon photography. And as a um, magazine that's as long-standing as Photo Pictorial, they think they should be also displaying, if not commenting or promoting this kind of practice. So this is how you would read uh, Dislocation. You would kind of flip through this salon photography magazine, arrive at the last page um, with the editors afterward, and then you come to this rather different looking um, smaller magazine of contemporary photography. Dislocation uh, was a monthly magazine, just like Photo Pictorial. Uh, and each issue, uh, they invite practitioners to curate that um, particular 
magazine that particular issue. And um, I was speaking to um, the founder of the magazine, Le Gassing, who's now based in Toronto. Um, he moved to Toronto shortly after the handover and has been based there since. So that's also you know, another story. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what they were thinking about um, dislocation was they were treating it as an exhibition space that had a circulation. So, um, and that's kind of, kind of uh, I'm, that's why I'm proposing that, you know, it's an interesting way to think through ecologies um, using magazines. The first, uh, the sound work issue uh, is a in international invitation of works that um, Le Gassing and the photographers were relying on. So it really showed the kind of networks that these photographers had. Uh, the middle one is a issue called Fabrication, curated by um, Hong Kong's uh, major curator, um, Oscar Ho. And the third issue uh, is Photo Booth, which uh, I'll show you an image, which is basically a whole issue of selfies. Um, this is Fabrication, so you also see a bit of art writing. And um, as a photography magazine, you're actually seeing how um, they are manipulating that space that they have to do things that you would not kind of expect in a usual magazine. This is the photo booth issue. And it actually shows you a slice of the ecology at the time because the contributors are not only just photographers, but also painters, installation artists, writers, and it is a way through which you can see how the ecology was networked and how they were mobilizing each other. Uh, we were speaking about um, the magazine as an ex exhibition space. Um, Dislocation actually did actual exhibitions, and this was uh, an invitation card of um, one of their exhibitions of the original works, which, believe it or not, was held um, on a beach on the southern side of the island in Sao. Oh. Um, the the exhibition space called Visage 2 was actually an iteration of a, a whole generation of Visage spaces. Um, so one of his iterations was in Sekho, in the village. And um, I was speaking about how Photo Pictoria was one of the first magazines to enter China and it itself is an institution. So you also see this kind of push and pull in terms of ideology and um, with the younger magazine of dislocation. And this particular image is a work by Carrie Kwok, uh, a previously Hong Kong-based photographer. I think now he's also in Toronto, or he might be in Australia. I'm not remembering right now. But this was an issue, uh, an image where uh, the photo pictorial editors were saying, we cannot publish this if we don't censor this image. And so out of this uh, a conversation with the dislocation editors, they decided to put a, a translucent band of a sensor over it in order to make sure that they won't get uh, into any trouble. And um, then very kind of very organically, the dislocation editors took on this uh, incident and make the next issue on censorship. So there's also this fluidity where when you're interrogating uh, different topics in each issue uh, for each month, there's this way, um, there's this kind of space where you can respond to whatever is most, most contemporary and be dynamic that way. And uh, this issue I wanted to show, is, this is uh, during 1997, and you see this location kind of functioning as a vehicle for art writing. So for a whole year, uh, dislocation in, in 1997 was looking at this um, topic of on Hong Kong as the British colo colony was becoming again um, part of China. So for each month they were publishing some bits of writing, some more works that were particularly um, resonant to Hong Kong residents and all. So that's kind of my little case study. Okay. Um, so. so I'd like to ask one question of all of you uh, and then hand over to the audience uh, if there are any questions. And I think there are some microphones being passed around. Um, first, firstly, with Michelle, you know, the, the theme that I want to ask us to think about is this idea of proliferation. How, you know, because I was very surprised to hear from Anna Leticia that, you know, there is this sort of burgeoning that's much more recent. And then, you know, with, uh, with ROH, um, you know, you, you've talked about your young history and also the dynamism of it, you know, trying to handle so many different aspects. So, you know, the idea of uh, proliferation of galleries, uh, you know, 
a proliferation of energies. So that sort of brings us back in time a little bit to dislocation. So what happened? Did it lead to things? Did it sort of, uh, you know, uh, generate a lot of other activity or, you know, how, you know, it ended. So yeah. why? <laughs> um, why and it how? Did generate a, uh, it did generate a lot of different activities. Um, but not necessarily connected to dislocation per se, but um, people who were around dislocation were running spaces, and because they were photographers, they were also running their own back, uh, black rooms. And these became kind of congregation spaces where they discuss, where they kind of exchange and all. One thing that um, the dislocation kind of folks did uh, was very interesting, I found I, I wasn't able to show this here, is um, they started something called the OP edition which was a kind of a small group of people that were beginning to think about um, kind of collecting photography and selling photography in artist uh, editions and all these things. And it was a conscious effort to kind of educate the public on how do you collect um, photography. So it was a very kind of, um, that really is an ecology issue. How is, is something sustainable? Yeah. So there's this intense, uh, activity about photography, but also its intellectual dimensions, its political dimensions, but then also, you know, thinking very much about how photography as a pr practice can be sustained and continue in, in Hong Kong. So I know with with um, ROH that, you know, in, in your short sort of discussion, it wasn't just about setting up a gallery. All of a sudden you, you realize that you had to intervene at so many levels. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit more about um, you know, this kind of proliferation of activity that you also find yourself in the stream of? Sure. Basically, I think we, we came to a realization that um, the general consensus about the ecologies in Indonesia in particular is a negative one. Uh, we have issues with regards to philanthropy, for instance. Uh, we have these huge public institutions and uh, museums that were initiated by uh, private kind of uh, forces. And uh, in many ways, there are many problems with it. And to, to start from A to Z, it would be about uh, the fact that, for instance, um, they don't have any independent institution to verify uh, the authenticity of these works, for mm -hmm. instance. They don't maintain the works properly. <clears throat> we don't have a proper kind of platform for these kinds of things. Um, similarly, we, we don't have any proper institution uh, for that we talked about pre uh, perhaps in our previous talk mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that supports uh, the arts in a sustainable manner. We don't have a museum. Mm. Um, we had a very big biennial last year, the Yogyakarta Biennial, mm. and the government didn't properly support it either and they didn't give us any sponsorship at all. So uh, coming as a gallerist, uh, we just try to look for the needs and try to meet those needs. So uh, I was put in charge of uh, looking for donations for the uh, biennial. And it's really interesting that this biennial uh, became very much uh, privately funded as well. So it's these kinds of issues that uh, we find in Indonesia that made me realize that it really requires a different process and different approach for us to be able to really just meet the needs of our art ecology, perhaps. And Leticia, you also brought up some questions about policy, because in this sense you can see that, you know, one of the things that's very, very encouraging to hear from you, June, is that there is initiative. You know, people will get things done. Sure. Uh, they, they recognize things. So, you know, there's this, this sense of dynamism. And I guess, you know, I'm using the word, you know, not only do spaces proliferate or uh, agencies or activities, but you know, there's that, there's that kind of dynamism. But you'd also made reference to cultural policy. Um, and I'm wondering how, you know, you know uh, just the various kinds of disparate sort of cases that we've talked about, how we can think that cultural policy is an important way of intervening. Mm -hmm. It's not always to say that we have to rely on the state to do something, but even um, uh, sort of the private agencies, if they can think in those terms, like think of, think of, uh, you know, how do we do things? How do we set sort of practices? So it's not necessarily, you know, state-led cultural policy, but even sort of policy among uh, independent agencies. I mean, is that something that, I, I would imagine that some of the things that you've already uh, encountered and, and dealt with, Anna Leticia, you know, some of those, those, those issues. Yes, definitely. Um, well, I believe that uh, 
sustainable and interesting art system. It's composed by these different initiatives that come from private and public sectors. And uh, I think nowadays it, we're really experiencing maybe uh, new models of operating because exactly we we cannot uh, anymore rely on or or the government to kind of uh, develop the policies for the arts or only leaving to the market to, to do it so the private sector. So uh, what you see more and more is this sort of the, the synergy, synergies and, and ways of collaboration that was that are probably uh, ways to go. So <clears throat> in Brazil, for instance, uh, the fact that the art markets is especially uh, one of the pillars of the system that's more solid now and, and developing and growing. But uh, we also see this, uh, the, the many of the, 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 the developments and activities that are initiated in the art market <coughs> are now uh, sort of, uh, we're finding ways of New, new business models or ways of collaborating with the non-for-profit uh, initiatives and so on. So not waiting for the state to to interfere. So, but I, I think, uh, yeah, in an ideal uh, world uh, would, would be also, I mean, the public policy would also be there to uh, bridge or to, to, to do a part that uh, the private sector cannot do. And I'm especially concerned with uh, the, the, the art production itself or, or the development of content and the, 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 and, and the critics and uh, curators, independent curators and so on. That's wh where they find in their space of existing in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm, I've been studying uh, a lot the art market and, and that's because the art market's doing well and so they demand my expertise, mm -hmm. but I would m much like to do. Uh, I study on like the the artistic, uh, the artist uh, um, production uh, um, condition of production. How how the artists are working, if they are really benefiting for this moment of the market that's so dynamic and so on. Uh, is 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 the the growth of the market impacting in the artistic art production and so on, and of how these other agents are operating. Uh, so I think, we, yeah, we, we, when I think about cultural policy, we have to consider the, the initiatives that are taken, uh, not only on a governmental level, but in all other levels of the art system. But ideally, would, would, we would have, uh, yeah, a more balanced uh, system where uh, we could have maybe public funds for more research for traveling for the independent agents and so on, the ones that are not totally, they, they cannot and they should not only rely on the market. Mm -hmm. If I could open up to the audience if there are uh, comments or questions. Yes, um, do we have a microphone? Um, if you could uh, kindly um, state your name, because we're recording everything, so it'd be okay. Easy. I'm I'm Margaret. Hi. Um, can I ask uh, a question for Michelle? Because it's about AAA. So um, because um, as I know, AAA has been developed uh, over ten years or more, also. We're already. fourteen. <laughs> oh, fourteen. Yeah. And we were founded in year two thousand. Right, so um, as as you've said that. Um, um, the purpose was to, um, you know, to document the, the artwork and facilitate research. So basically, I think maybe filling the gaps, um, mm -hmm. which I guess that gap would be quite big as well because nothing had been set up before. So, but I, w but what, what I want to ask is about um, throughout, you know, 14 years. Um, do you, do you, do you, do the team actually um, identify uh, some you know laser focus throughout the, uh, throughout the years that becoming narrowing down to something that you want to really um, look for? I mean, over the years you've had um, what happens is you know there are these sort of moments of concentration on things. I think you're still trying to deal with so many issues yeah and 
I think, you know, I can, I was thinking about what you were, and a teacher, you were saying about working with other people. And I think a, a uh, I can speak for, you know, where I'm working from, which is in Hong Kong and the head office is you have to work with everyone mm. because the, the art ecology, as small as it is, it is still quite big in terms of, you know, you only have 24 hours a day and you can do only so many things. You can only go to so many exhibitions and ask so many questions at the same, like at one time. So um, on a research level, what we do is um, we work with collaborators. And we work with many collaborators in Hong Kong. We've worked with um, the Hong Kong Museum of Art, which is another project that I, I lead, which I didn't speak about, but it's an art history research um, project in Hong Kong that looks into precisely how the art ecology was functioning. And um, I think one of the ways to kind of address this really, really big question is to, one takes a position and takes up lines of inquiry and be flexible as you adjust to them. So it's like Asia. Asia is a definition that constantly changes. One Asia in one particular historical time is different from another. It's like, Hong Kong before 1997 is probably different from Hong Kong now. And it's how do you articulate these differences and how do you compare not only same, same, but also same, different? Your question sort of um, also cuts to uh, a problem that I think uh, every sort of situation uh, has is that you have such a, a large, vast area to cover and how do you deal with focuses? And in some ways, it's very kind of accidental and organic. So if you're collaborating with something, somebody, then all of a sudden that becomes a priority. Uh, yeah. Sorry. When you start off something, you start off something and do something organically and then when you, you know, go along the way, uh, you, you, you need, need to, you know, uh, find some focus as well to develop, in order to develop it further. So uh, to narrow down my question is, do you actually find something that you would go further, specifically, I in this stage? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just curious. What, what about, would you like to respond first? What, what would you hope to kind of focus on? Well, right now, I hope to, yeah, so actually, I wasn't going to share this yet, but <laughs> <laughs> I, guess I, I guess it's interesting to, to share. Um, we really try to find meet, uh, needs and meet them. Uh, for instance, we don't have a proper production facility for the production of metal works in Indonesia, or foundry, for instance. Uh, that really uses Western production techniques, proper safety, and works that actually stand the test of time. So this year, what Raw Projects is planning on doing is to start a foundry. And we've started our experimentation and uh, different uh, projects that we want to do with it. Um, we also try to find uh, other needs of uh, different artists who need help to connect with a scientific research uh, facility, for instance, in Japan. And we try to make these connections happen for these artists. And it's really about trying to really meet those needs uh, I mean, that we want you to know, focus on. One of the problems is that I think even 14 years is not that long a time. Mm -hmm. So that you're still dealing with so many, you know, various kinds of needs. I know, mm -hmm. you know, th there's that theme in your, uh, I mean, that, that issue in your question about continuing to pursue something. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. with Archive in the beginning, you could see that they were covering so many things. But now I think that you really do see uh, a sustained development on a number of projects. Sure. Uh, I think in your case, Michelle, also, you know, you've been speaking specifically to the Hong Kong situation. Mm -hmm. But of course, Asia Art Archive uh, deals, you know, with the whole whatever it is, you know, the continent. I can also speak a little about our other projects. Say, for example, um, one of the strands that we do pursue in, in the AAA is art writing. And so in India, one of uh, the, the projects that we just launched a couple of months ago was this, uh, after a year-long kind of research gathering process, is this bibliography of art writing in India for the past 100 years in 14 vernacular languages. 
So um, again, you know, that is an extremely interesting project because of how the strategy of researching was being launched, that we were identifying resource persons in these different regions in India, and then they would reach out to the people that they know have the right language skills and the access to the libraries in order to gather this information. And we've launched with um, three languages, if I remember correctly, is English, Hindi, and Marathi. And the rest will roll out in the year. So it's actually like, like Junwa was saying, there are different needs in these different ecologies, and you choose to address them in very specific ways, uh, especially in ways that you can build on top of it. I think what AAA has also developed to do is to develop these research tools, whether in the China 1980s projects, which were a lot of interviews, or interviews, which our Hong Kong projects also follow. And then through this digitization of personal archives of people who are willing to share, because you can't go to other people who's like, give us our archives, you, this just doesn't work that way. So it has to be um, through a mutual collaboration where uh, we're eye to eye on the sharing of information and access. A lot of times the priorities also emerge through, uh, you know, I mean, when you're thinking about people are older and you need to get the oral archives from them. So those are some of the things that also often determine uh, archives. And I, I know, you know th that's also been the impetus behind a few projects. We're, we are running out of time. And I wanted to give an, an opportunity to the panelists to sort of ask questions uh, of themselves, you know, uh, if there's any sort of uh, uh, questions that you have of, uh, for each other. I actually have for you. OK. <laughs> <laughs> No, just just uh, if you could talk about uh, the situation in Singapore a little yes, bit. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, okay. Um, you know, in contrast to the beautiful mess, and uh, um, there's a certain kind of orderliness that Singapore is famous for, and I like to sort of caricature it. Uh, so it, it's an exaggeration, but sometimes when you exaggerate, you're actually accurate. You know, like the, there are no gaps in Singapore except between, you know, the train station and the platform, right? Everything else is so seamless. This idea of this society of control and, uh, you know, there are often a lot of comparisons between Hong Kong and Singapore being these very, very dynamic, uh, corpor corporate capitalists. But, you know, there is this sort of myth of Singapore being, you know, far more uh, coordinated and centralized. I mean, you'll go to a neighborhood in Hong Kong and you'll think, okay, uh, this place hasn't changed in, let's say, 20 years, but in Singapore, you never find that. You know, everything is today. You know, uh, even the past is constantly being renovated. You know, like, of course, I'm exaggerating. Um, and, you know, in, in that kind of situation, you know, you have um, where, you know, so this idea that there's a lot of investment in the arts, but it, it all often very much gets sort of coordinated through central processes rather than, uh, you know, through all these kinds of initiatives. So, you know, if it's, you know, it's unbalanced and it's undynamic in the sense that there's a lot of energy, but, you know, can you identify this dynamism? These are, of course, I, I'm exact, again, let me qualify, I'm, I'm exaggerating. Uh, what we spoke of earlier before we, we uh, got out here and we were in the hidden little green room behind that door. <laughs> Uh, you know, we were talking about one of, I think one of the problems here and, and a panel like this, you know, what I, we hope it sort of initiates is these kinds of conversations in a much more sustained way. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to talk about the local ecologies, but then how do you address uh, regional ecologies? So if, for instance, Singapore has uh, a certain amount of resources that are, you know, centralized, there's a lot of concern and investment to put money into the arts, how does that then, you know, how can we have conversations with Hong Kong, uh, you know, with Indonesia, where I think there was a lot, you know, there's all this mutual envy, you know, um, June was talking about on the one hand, I used to work at this art space called the substation, a small or medium sized art center. And when a, a student of mine in Indonesian uh, studying in Singapore was researching the National Gallery in Indonesia, she was telling me the budget of the National Gallery, and it wasn't much different than the substation's budget and you know it was, sh was shocking to hear so you know there there isn't enough of this um kind of dialogue so there's envy on the part of indonesia for uh much more sort of public resources but on the part of singapore there's envy that there isn't enough dynamism and initiative um 
And this comes back to you know publications. You know when Michelle was talking about publications, I was saying in Singapore the, the story of publications is always a very sad one because it's always about publications ending. And so while they do represent these sort of microcosms of, of uh, ecologies, then you have this, you know, it's just ecological disaster after another. It's you know it's that. And so this is why you know thinking about. Um, Brazil, I was very, very surprised to hear that you know this is one of the the deficit areas. So um, I think I think we do need to wrap up. Maybe I can I can um, I wanted to bring in. There's a beautiful tattoo on Ana Letitia's arm, right? <laughs> it's a, uh, if it, uh, wh who's the artist's work? It's Silvio Meirelles. Uh, Brazilian? Yes. And so it's it's ladders on one half, uh, and so if you see the step ladder, the, the, ladders, actually. the it's, it's sort of broken. Really and then them. on the other side, it's you know just the just the inside. But you know there's this there's this idea of, of ladders. Uh, the very, uh, uh, an Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein was talking about how um, he wants his work to be like a ladder, where you just use the ladder to get to a different point, and then you discard the ladder. So uh, in that sense, you know. We've been trying to think about some of the problems that we have, but then there are other issues behind them that we were really trying to get to. So I hope those ideas uh, continue to stay with us, even though the specifics may have been lost. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, Letitia, June, and Michelle. Thank you. Thank you.